Good morning, everybody. It is Saturday morning, and therefore I am recording from my home office as opposed to my normal office. So slightly different setting than you guys are used to seeing me in. Um, I last night was recording a whole bunch of CMS videos um, and got pretty late, decided it would be better to wait till morning so that I could hopefully refresh, provide you with a better video than I can after a long day. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about two of the enoviruses, Coxsackie and Echovirus. Um, enoviruses are actually all picornaviruses, uh, which basically means they're all very, very, very small viruses. Um, and the picornaviruses, several of them do kind of have this um, preference for the brain or the ability to cause problems in the brain, but it's not just the brain. Um, both of these viruses, Coxsackie and Echo, can also cause issues um, throughout other parts of the body, um, particularly the heart, um, and there's also a um, exanthem that's associated with Coxsackie virus. Um, the main um, enterovirus that we're not going to talk about in this video that affects the CNS is polio. Um, we're going to talk about that kind of on its own in a later case. So for now, we're just going to focus on these two. Okay, so like I just said, these guys are picornavirus family members. Um, these viruses make up some of the most important human and animal viruses. Um, they're very small, hence PICO, small RNA viruses. All of these have an RNA genome. They also have a naked icosahedral capsid structure. So we're not talking about enveloped viruses here. Um, there are actually more than 200 picornaviruses. Um, I actually got my PhD studying a picornavirus that leads to an MS-like um, disease in animal models. So uh, picornaviruses, many of them have a manifestation in the brain. They're a really wide range. Um, of uh, viruses. It also includes the rhinovirus, which obviously is the cause of many common colds that people experience throughout the year. So both Coxsackie and Echoviruses are part of what's known as the enterovirus group of the picornavirus family. Um, this group of picornaviruses are highly, highly stable. And it's really because of this icosahedral capsid. This icosahedral capsid is really, really strong. Um, it's able to withstand the very low pH of our gastrointestinal tract, a pH of three. And that kind of enables them to be transmitted via the fecal oral route, which is how we see Coxsackie and Echo get into the body most of the time. Um, the Coxsackie virus was actually named for the place where it was first found, which is a town called Coxsackie, New York, um, where it was first isolated. The Echo virus group is actually a little bit more cryptic. It was named Enteric Cytopathic Human orphan virus. And the name is derived this way because for a long time, the agents that were causing um, these conditions weren't really known. So that's why they're called echoviruses. Okay, so like I mentioned, this is a fecal oral route um, pathogen. Um, and even though they're called enteroviruses, that has more to do with their transmission than the diseases they actually cause because they don't really tend to cause gastroenteritis. Okay, so what do they cause? Disease produced by enteroviruses are determined mainly by their tissue trophism. So you can see all of these enteroviruses, um, echovirus, Coxsackie, polio, which again, we're gonna talk about elsewhere, HAV, um, all of those come in via the fecal oral route. Then they replicate in lymphoid tissues. So they start over here in like the tonsils um, and pharynx. And then as they get down into the gastrointestinal tract, they're going to replicate in M cells and lymphocytes of the Peyer's patches. So basically those lymphoid organs um, in the gastrointestinal tract, lymphoid organs, lymphoid cells down there. And then from there, once they've established kind of a nice foothold, then they're going to circulate throughout the body in our vasculature. And that's basically causing a viremic state. But it also, more importantly, allows for systemic infection. Um, and that's how it's going to get to all of these different um, targets places. So you've got a primary viremia, um, and that's kind of what we associate most of the time. So during this primary viremia, patients are going to experience some sort of kind of malaise or be asymptomatic. 
Um, then after we get past this primary viremic, they go into these target tissues and that can be associated with a secondary viremia. And you can see here, they have a wide range of target tissues. Um, so hepatitis A virus, we learned about that back in your food to fuel block in the Mikey Eakins case where we um, talked about all the hepatitis viruses, but obviously that was causing um, enteric hepatitis, and it makes sense because it's an enterovirus. But echo, polio, and coxsackie all can lead to meningitis, encephalitis, and obviously polio can lead to a paralytic disease, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. Thankfully, it is not something we see um, anymore because of widespread vaccination. You can also see issues with muscles, particularly the heart. So carditis is a common, um, not common, but a, a seen um, uh, association with this infection. Ooh, can't talk this morning. Okay, and then skin, we're gonna talk about hand, foot, mouth disease. So basically, you're gonna see this get into the bloodstream and spread throughout the body. So during the kind of prodrome, this initial viremia, you might see some viral shedding, um, not a lot, um, but if, and, and I'm talking about from the oropharynx. So you might detect it for a short time period during this prodrome. Um, antibodies are really, really important for protecting from disease. It's the major protective immune response. But once we get into the target tissue um, and once it's in the intestines, we actually see viral shedding in the GI tract for up to 30 plus days. Um, so this is one of those ones that I talk about that um, because the shedding period is so long, we see particularly this hand, foot, mouth disease from Coxsackie any place small children gather and gather they do. So daycare centers, things like that, because the, you've got this viral shedding and it's fecal oral and kids love to put things in their mouths. So we just kind of see it run through schools. Okay, let's talk about the various um, clinical syndromes we associate with Coxsackie and echoviruses. First off, I should have said this earlier, there are kind of two types of Coxsackie virus, uh, Coxsackie A and Coxsackie B, and they do have kind of different clinical associations. First things first, a lot of people are going to be asymptomatic or just kind of have like malaise. Um, respiratory infections also pretty common. And that's true with all of these. So Coxsackie A and B and echovirus, same for being asymptomatic. We can see that with Coxsackie A, B or echovirus. And that's pretty common for viruses, right? Viruses affect different people differently. Um, and there's no real rhyme or reason to it here. Um, but for the majority of the rest of the clinical syndromes that I'm going to talk about here, it's dependent on the viral serotype, um, the infective dose, the tissue tropism, um, the portal of entry, how old the patient is, gender, and the patient's overall like constitution, um, and particularly if the patient is pregnant as well. That's something that we consider. So some of the more common or significant um, manifestations of disease are listed in this table. This isn't a complete list, but these are kind of the ones that I keep an eye on. Um, so first off, paralytic, yes. Um, we do see paralysis with all three of them. It's pretty sporadic, um, probably has something to do with kind of the strains that are circulating. It's not nearly as common as say paralysis that we associated with polio, um, which thankfully is also very infrequent at this point. Um, but yeah, we can see paralysis with any of the enteroviruses. Um, encephalitis and meningitis, um, this is a weird one. It does account for approximately 5% of the aseptic encephalitides that we see per year. Um, patients with an aseptic meningitis are still going to have that rapid or gradual onset of fever, nausea, and vomiting, as well as malaise, headache, neck pain, light sensitivity, and potentially upper respiratory signs. Because think about it, that's kind of where the virus first takes hold. Um, seizures also might occur. Um, so we do see that. But when we see it, we see it in kind of outbreaks. Like we know we've got a strain of Coxsackie that is, seems to be causing more and more encephalitis and meningitis. And then it'll go away again. Um, carditis. Carditis is kind of sporadic with this one. Um, so you can see myocardial and pericardial infections caused by Coxsackie B virus. Um, sporadically in older children and adults. Um, the thing is that it's most life-threatening when we think about newborns. Um, neonates with these infections, they have this febrile illness 
and then an unexplained onset of heart failure. Um, and you see cyanosis and tachycardia and cardiomegaly and often hepatomegaly can all occur. Um, the mortality rate for this is super high um, and it reveals kind of involvement of other organ systems, including the brain and the liver and the pancreas. Um, we can also see this from either Coxsackie or echo, particularly in adults. And what you find with adults is that they they come in for some sort of cardiac symptom um, or weakness or fatigue or difficulty breathing or some sort of edema, some sort of thing where you're going like, this is cardiac and it's not really working and I'm not really sure why. Um, and then in interview, you find out they were sick, you know, previously, like a month, two, three weeks earlier, they had sort of this non-specific viral illness. And then you go, oh, it might be Coxsackie. So that's kind of a way you can think of this from like a clinical picture. Um, so neonatal disease, uh, that's kind of what I was just saying as well, that you see particularly with Coxsackie B um, in neonatal disease, you can see carditis. But remember neonates, we also see that involvement of the other organ systems. Okay. Hand, foot, mouth. Now, I'm going to tell you a funny story about hand, foot, mouth. A couple of funny stories about hand, foot, mouth. So I wanted to make hand, foot, mouth a case in our curriculum. Um, and I said this to some of my fellow, um, you know, colleagues. And they said, no, 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 cocksacky, it goes to the brain. It's just a brain thing. Why do you want to do hand, foot, mouth? But literally, I have a five-year-old. Every child I know, five and under, has had hand, foot, mouth, including my own. It's been through my kid's daycare twice. Uh, hand, foot, mouth caught me by surprise when I was out to lunch for some, with some friends. And my kid was acting a little, um, you know, tired that day, cranky. I thought he was teething. I kind of, you know, tickled at him like, what's up, bud, like you do with a baby. And then he vomited all over the table. And new mom, I should have been prepared. I had no extra clothes for him. I wound up like wrapping him in a camisole and sticking him in the car seat. And I get into the car and I'm looking at him and I look at his feet and I see this. And I went, oh no, it's hand, foot, and mouth. And the reason I did that is because one, that means it's everywhere. It's like, it, it's all throughout his daycare. Every kid's gonna have it. And sure enough, on Monday, like most of the class was gone. Two, it's going to keep shedding for like a month. So it's just going to keep happening. Um, it's unlikely that he would get it again. And thankfully he didn't. But that's the thing. This one just goes. So um, it's pretty common um, according to CDC and various other sites. Um, it's not one of the classical childhood exanthems um, like measles, mumps, rubella. Um, luckily, those are less. So measles, rubella, and varicella are not as common as they once were because they're vaccine eligible, which makes this one a little bit more common as far as childhood exanthems go. Um, the name is very descriptive because that's where we see these sores. And they do kind of, they look like little pimples, right? Um, so we see them on the hands, the feet, and the mouth. And in the mouth, you can see them. They're in here. They're like little ulcers, little canker sores in little, little babies or small children that can't really tell you anything except for that their mouth hurts. Um, popsicles help a lot. Um, and there's really nothing else we can do. The patient is often febrile, but the illness subsides in a few days. A lot of popsicles, a lot of love from mom and dad, and things are fine. Okay, so how are we going to diagnose it? How are we going to treat it? So let's just start with treatment. For Coxsackie and Echo, there's no vaccine and treatment, like I said, is just supportive. Um, if we talk about polio virus, which we will later, um, another enterovirus, that one there is a vaccine and it's very, very effective. Okay, let's talk about diagnosis. So for the vast majority of the presentations, you're not going to diagnose. Um, so asymptomatic people, obviously not looking for a diagnosis. Random viral illness, probably not going to try to diagnose that. Hand, foot, mouth, you're not going to try to chase that down. It just is. You see the rash and you go, yep, it's hand, foot, mouth, and that's about it. Um, but for meningitis, paralysis, carditis, you're going to want to know if it was an infectious etiology or try to figure out where it's coming from and how that might affect your treatment plan. Right, because let's say you think it's viral meningitis, but it was actually bacterial meningitis. You could have done something about that with antibiotics. So we need to check out the CSF profile, certainly, to make sure that we're dealing with a viral illness, not bacterial. Um, same with culture. You can culture these. Um, they grow pretty well in host cells. 
So you could culture this out and then do either PCR or antigen. You can also do PCR on CSF or blood um, for viral antigens. You can do serology. Remember with serology, you're going to want to look for IgM um, early on. If you see IgG, that doesn't necessarily tell you that that's what the patient had now. It just tells you that at some point they had it. All right, that's all I have on Coxsackie and um, Echo. We will talk about polio in a future video.